Enchanted forests are described in the oldest folklore from regions where forests are common and are often alluded to as a place of magic and danger, a location beyond where people normally travel, where strange things might occur and strange people might live. Monsters, witches, fairies, dragons, dwarves, elves, giants, gnomes, trolls, Unicorns and other mythical creatures are depicted in books of fantasy for centuries, but whose oral tradition go all the way back to prehistory. Some stories have trees that talk or with branches that will push people off their horses. Others feature sorcerers and witches living somewhere in the depths of the forest. Anthropologically speaking, they represent places unknown to the characters and provides situations of transformation and liminality, a word which comes from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold, and is used in the context of the ambiguity or disorientation that occurs in the middle stages of a rite of passage, when participants no longer hold their pre-ritual status, but have not yet begun the transition to the status they will hold when the rite is complete. So it's where one is standing at the threshold between their previous way of being and a new way or identity which completing the rite establishes. In Norse myth and legend, Mirkwood was a dark and dangerous forest that separated various lands. Heroes and even gods had to traverse it with difficulty. Back in the early 1800s, Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm were brothers who while working as librarians, put together a collection of 86 stories, mostly from Germanic folklore, first published in 1812, and in all of them, the hero always goes into the forest. Acting as a place of transformation, the forest can also be a place of magical refuge, such as with Snow White, who escaped from her stepmother into a forest with dwarves. It is in the forest that the dwarf of Rumpelstiltskin reveals his name, allowing the heroine a way to free herself. In a study published in the journal Royal Society Open Science, a folklorist and anthropologist say that the popular stories and fairy tales are much older than originally thought. Instead of dating from the 1500s, the researchers say that some of these classic stories date back thousands of years. For example, Beauty and the Beast and Rumpelstiltskin to be about 4,000 years old. This contradicts previous speculation that story collectors like the Brothers Grimm were relaying tales that were only a few hundred years old. In the article, the team tracked the presence of the tales in 50 Indo-European or Aryan language-speaking populations they were able to find the ancestries of 76 tales, tracking them backward using language trees. As they tracked, they found evidence that some of the tales were actually based in other stories. More than a quarter of the stories turned out to have ancient roots. Jack and the Beanstalk was rooted in a group of stories classified as the boy who stole ogre's treasure and could be traced back to when Eastern and Western Indo-European languages split more than 5,000 years ago. And a folktale called The Smith and the Devil, about a blacksmith selling his soul in a pact with the devil in order to gain supernatural abilities, was estimated to go back 6,000 years. In it, a blacksmith strikes a deal with a malevolent supernatural being, such as the devil, death, or a genie, the blacksmith exchanges his soul for the power to weld any materials together. He then uses this power to stick the villain to an immovable object, such as a tree, to renege on his side of the bargain. This basic plot is stable throughout the Indo-European speaking world, from India to Scandinavia, according to this research. The findings seem to confirm the long disregarded theory of fairy tale writer Wilhelm Grimm, who thought that all Indo European or Aryan cultures shared common tales, 
Some of the fairy tales go back thousands of years older than the earliest literary records, going back into the Bronze Age. The study said that this tale could be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European or Aryan society, when metallurgy likely existed and there was an archaeological and genetic evidence of massive territorial expansions by nomadic tribes from the southern Russian steppe and the northern shores of the Black Sea between five and 6,000 years ago. These findings are interesting, as a little over 7,000 years ago, the Black Sea, which was formed by melted glaciers, was a freshwater lake, until an event that geologists and anthropologists call the Black Sea Deluge happened, which not only flooded the people living near the shores, but the water was no longer usable for agricultural purposes, which may be a major impetus for the first waves of what is historically known as the Aryan invasions, where the Proto-Indo-Europeans, or Aryans, migrated to places where we find rivers for agricultural purposes, such as the Indus Valley, which did not have horses before the Aryans arrived, implementing an ethnic caste system, the remnants and traces of which can still be found in India today, not to mention Sanskrit, which is an Indo-European language. They also settled Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, establishing what eventually became some of the earliest empires of the Holocene, meaning our current age, the time following the Ice Age. Of course, these Aryans also penetrated into Europe, introducing domesticated animals to the continent, such as cows. And even today, Northern Europeans are among the most lactose-tolerant people on Earth, a genetic trait that comes directly from milk-drinking Aryans and is a clear genetic marker of the Aryan roots and genetic affinities in Scandinavia and the Germanic people. Another shared genetic indicator is blood type, such as a high degree of Rh negative, which I cover in my book, Species with Amnesia, and identify as a trait part of the haplotype that can be traced back into the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, to Cro-Magnon, the name of the first specimen found in a cave near the Atlantic, in the Pyrenees. Cro-Magnon is the direct ancestor of the population that settled near the Black Sea and Anatolia after the Ice Age, which incidentally is where Noah settled in the Bible, Mount Ararat, which is part of the Caucasus Mountains in modern Turkey and Armenia, and where the term Caucasian comes from and from where the Aryans spread their languages, domesticated animals, and agricultural civilization from, and why they were considered the ethnic, blue-eyed nobility of every agricultural society of the Holocene, no exceptions. This may help to explain this quote by Rudolf Steiner, when he said, quote, The greatest part of the Atlantean population declined, and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans who comprise present-day civilized humanity. Which brings me to another interesting quote by U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote in his book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, quote, Did the Aryan race come from Atlantis? The center of the Aryan migrations was Armenia. Here, too, is Mount Ararat, where it is said the Ark rested, identified with the flood regions, representing the usual transfer of Atlantis legend by the Atlantean people to a high mountain in their new home. The Greeks, who are Aryans, trace their descent from the people who were destroyed by the flood, as did other races clearly Aryan. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon, they make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. It has really helped me to increase my content output. So I am grateful and very much appreciate the support I've been receiving. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I also appreciate anyone that shares these videos. So thank you. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. 
I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section as always. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon.